Okay, at the uh, request of my uh, students in Chemie 340, um, which is a uh, biochemical engineering uh, introductory class, um, I'm going to go through the slides I have here on um, interface mass transfer. So in uh, bioreactors, uh, a really important aspect of, of, of operation is getting oxygen from the gas, which is usually blown into the system, and getting that to transfer into the, uh, the liquid. Uh, case studies that this was most closely related to, and that's where we'll end this, is how it relates to the uh, production of two compounds. One is insulin from like a microbial or E. coli type uh, fermentation, and uh, EPO, uh, erythropotin, which is a, uh, a hormone related to uh, red blood cell production. And one of the classic uh, first sort of biotech uh, products made in a mammalian cell line, or a Chinese hamster ovary. Um, and so uh, I will then uh, be presenting uh, essentially uh, building on the concept of, 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 of interface mass transfer that's between a gas and a, and a liquid phase, but I'll hit some of the basics of, of in general transport phenomenon and, and mass transfer as we go. Um, so uh, I'm going to go ahead and share the screen now, which will be here. Uh, which probably um, doesn't change anything. Um, let me uh, go ahead and start the, uh, it's one of the first times I've, I've done this. Let me see, display settings, and I will swap the slides. Okay, um, so this is oxygen mass transfer, but as I've mentioned in, in, in other aspects of the class, um, it, it's equally true for other mass transfer, algae would be CO2, uh, and obviously, when you have a biological system, you have typically uh, the reciprocal oxygen converts uh, CO2 and or vice versa, CO2 to oxygen for, for the synthesis, but there's other uh, organisms that will actually uh, consume hydrogen and, as methane as well. Um, we've talked a lot uh, in the previous uh, lectures uh, about the uh, um, uh, other aspects of this gas holdup sort of being the amount of sort of bubbles that are holding up the liquid inside. So if you have a tank and it has bubbles in it, uh, the liquid level that you measure here, if you will, uh, is a combination of the dispersion, liquid circulation being very different, this being uh, a fluid element moving to, a, to another location, uh, which is very, very different than mixing is where you have a fluid element that's basically dispersed off into uh, many smaller uh, fluid elements. Uh, and that gives rise then to uh, sort of, as you know, mixing. And in fact, we discussed last time how uh, really good circulation often um, can give rise in a stirred tank to uh, poor mixing uh, as a result of keeping the fluid elements uh, together. Uh, there's a lot of other things that we talked about previously. I won't go into them now here too much, uh, but really focusing now on mass transfer. Uh, in this case, <clears throat> the bubbles clearly are the basis of the oxygen coming out of the gas and into the liquid dissolving. And, uh, and mixing also then is in part responsible for that primarily because mixing is also related to the breakup of bubbles. And we'll be talking a lot about KLA again. Uh, that is, this is interfacial area per unit volume, uh, which is when you take one bubble and make it in a lot of small ones, you can imagine uh, that you get a lot of more interfacial area per, per volume, and therefore this parameter, which is essentially mass transfer between the gas and the liquid, uh, will go up. Okay, so uh, that being the case, I'm going to go ahead and uh, go to the next slide. Uh, now, I wanted to start here with some basic concepts of transport phenomena. Uh, I will mention that in, in looking at this, uh, I hope this probably isn't life here, but this would be engineering, okay. Um, so the basic laws of engineering, uh, you keep coming back to them in, in many different forms. Uh, and uh, what it really comes down to is what you want, which is, is various things often related to productivity. Uh, and it's dependent on how hard you're willing to work and the stuff in your way. Um, and the stuff in your way can be uh, in, 
you know, the inverse of, of conductance, for example, and some of the things that here, you know, this one Ohm's law, for example, uh, you know, current is what you want, the voltage is the driving force, and resistance which stands in your way, but you can also uh, be one over conductance, which is a resistance, and that is sort of the direct analogy. Uh, acceleration, you want to move something, you got to push on it, and, uh, and here mass, or inertia, if you will, uh, is what's standing in your way. Uh, flow, of course, is what you'd like. You drive it with the driving, driving forces, pressure drop, viscosity makes sense as, as a resistance, and so these proportionalities exist. Things like heat transfer and mass transfer, which we're focusing on today, um, are typically expressed as conductances, and so uh, rather than a resistance, we actually have a you know, higher conductance as opposed to a smaller resistance, uh, but that doesn't a change if you uh, your, your kind of concept we have here. And in mass transfer, you have diffusion or Fick's law, for example. Uh, and the driving force here is concentration gradient, whereas in, in, in heat transfer, it is uh, thermal gradients. And there's a kind of classic uh, connection between these two, and that the math is so similar in many cases uh, that you can have an analogy, the Chilton Coburn analogy, that lets you uh, kind of interchange your thinking as well as your mathematics to solve uh, mass transfer problems by thinking and using the, the even the correlations that are developed uh, for mass transfer. <clears throat> so um, let's see, oh, I think I do need to, uh, to clear that, let's see here. Um, it's not being cooperative for me. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna go ahead and clear everything that is there. So I, I mentioned that I was going to then discuss uh, the, the analogy between the two. And, and certainly, um, for me, the, the, the place to start is in solids, because we can think about you know, thermal energy sort of moving through a solid. And we think and think about you know, a dye, if you will, uh, moving through jelly, so, jello. So, uh, and, and thermal conductivity, or K, is what gives rise to it. And just think of this as if this was a hot side here. Um, and if I had a high thermal conductivity, like this was metal, then this would be hot. Uh, if I had an insulator or something with a low thermal conductivity, there would be a big temperature difference here. Uh, and this would feel reasonably cool on this side. And so the mathematics or the, you know, the thermal conductivity being the resistance and or conductance and this being the driving force would ultimately tell you in each of these uh, how much uh, thermal energy is being transferred. Uh, in jello, if you will, uh, if you have a high concentration here and you have a very high diffusion coefficient, uh, then it'll be pretty easy for your mass to, 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 to go from one side to the other. And if you can, then the concentration on this side and, and on the other side will not be that big. Uh, on the other hand, if I have a, a, a low diffusion coefficient, so it's slow, um, and that means the conductance of mass through there is, is, is slow, uh, then you're going to have a big difference between the two, uh, one and the other. So uh, this is typically where um, you can kind of think in terms of, you know, okay, so here's fixed law. Uh, this is all, all well and good for movement, if you will, through materials. But uh, often, it's, it's really not within a material that we're that interested in. What we're really interested in um, is uh, from an interface. And so here now what we're talking about is a hot object. Uh, and then on this, this is a fluid, if you will. Um, and under circumstances where this is a, a fluid, um, the movement if you will, from, from the hot object uh, through a boundary layer here. Uh, so this is now in a boundary layer, okay. Um, the, it, it, you know, this is, this is the hot stove and this is your finger and if you get too close to it, uh, you'll, you'll feel in that boundary layer that it gets quite hot. Um, but it's the movement now through a different material. So it's not the movement in this object, we're just going to consider that object to be uh, all hot, if you will. Um, and then that is going out to some bulk temperature, like for instance, the room temperature or outside your windows would be the, uh, the window itself. 
Um, and so under these circumstances, the, the conductance is referred to as a heat transfer coefficient. Okay, so, um, and a boundary layer heat transfer coefficient. Now the size of this is, is the key thing, right? Um, because here now, uh, the boundary layer will change depending on how much, if you will, mixing do you have here in this. It's no longer like a, a solid. And the size of that boundary layer then changes uh, depending on, quite you know, simplistically, uh, how much flow you have. And so if I have very rapid flow, uh, then the boundary layer will, uh, will be small. Um, and if I have uh, just be increased flow, uh, and if I have uh, less mixing, if you will, um, then you have that. Now, reality is we don't actually measure this boundary layer. So thinking of it in terms of its thickness is really not what's going on so much as we combine that into this, this heat transfer coefficient. Okay, uh, if a heat transfer coefficient then is, is, is quite uh, large, and let's now say that this is the source and this is the sink, uh, then that a very high heat transfer um, coefficient would be down here, right? Um, then the surface temperature of the window, if you will, um, will be close to here, right? Uh, so there won't be a big difference between the two. Uh, if, on the other hand, I have a, a small heat transfer coefficient, um, then the temperature at the surface of the window will be quite a bit different from the, the bulk temperature. Um, mass transfer is the same, again, analogy. You have this bulk concentration out here in, in a fluid, and it's trying to get its way towards the surface here. Uh, if I have a high uh, again, uh, it may seem unfortunate that this is a K uh, because Ks are typically used for mass transfer coefficients. And you remember that Ks are used in the previous for the thermal conductivity. Uh, it's a consequence, unfortunate consequence actually, of uh, the limitations of the alphabet and our a tendency to choose to use very few of them. Um, but you got to remember that. So this is a interface uh, mass transfer coefficient, uh, not a uh, interface. Uh, oh, I wish I could spell better. Uh, maybe I'll try that. Okay, so I could actually do this and so call this an interface uh, mass transfer coefficient. Um, and and so the. Oops, uh, we'll go back to back to this. Well, hopefully so we can. So let's go back to drawing and um, again, analogy is here and so forth. We're talking about boundary layers, okay? Um, and so um, uh, keeping very close thinking here is that this is now going to be dependent on the same thing that a heat transfer coefficient was. A heat transfer coefficient is kind of easy to understand and we'll use that as analogy uh, to talk about uh, this analogy between the two as we go here. So uh, that and we'll go to the next slide. Now uh, just to go into a little bit uh, more details here for the, uh, the mass transfer, okay, uh, we have again this mass transfer interface mass transfer coefficient and we have a driving force. And what is that driving force? Well it is the surface temp concentration right here. Okay, that's what CS is supposed to mean. Okay, uh, and it is the bulk concentration. This could be, for instance, something dissolving or something like that. Um, the total mass transfer, since this is a flux term here, flux, remember, then has to be multiplied times area in order to get the total mass transfer. And so the total mass transfer then is multiply as a mass transfer coefficient, and to get the units right, we need to multiply times area. Uh, but the area is, is measurable here. Uh, you can measure um, this. You can measure this, right? Uh, you know, this is the size of the window. Okay, something is known. 
what's not known is the mass transfer coefficient, because we're going to talk about what that's dependent on, like the amount of wind, if you will. Uh, and, and so um, the driving force will be this from bulk to the, to the surface concentration. And this gives us an idea. And this mass transfer coefficient here is based on correlations. That's the key here. It's the flow conditions, the viscosity of the surrounding solution, right? It's nothing really to do with the solid over here. Uh, it's all about the liquid, its density, its liquid, and its dimensions here is what the D is, is referring to. So, um, you know, that being the case, we'll, we'll head on clear and go um, to a little bit more detailed look at interface mass transfer um, between a gas and a liquid, because we're talking about bioreactors here is our intention. And so this is intended to be inside the bubble, right? Um, this is on the outside of the bubble. Um, and this is a liquid out here, and this is a gas in here. Uh, what we have here then is, is clearly there are two interfaces, right? There's an interface, uh, a boundary layer here of the, the gas phase. Um, and so this is going to be related to the uh, mass transfer coefficient, uh, KL, uh, K of the, I'm sorry, K of the, the gas, right? And, and over here, it would be the boundary layer in the liquid side of the world here. And so this is going to be a KG. Now, um, um, I'm sorry, this is, this is liquid and that's supposed to be liquid as well. Um, so when you have resistances in series, okay, um, you add them up. Um, when you have resistances in parallel or the equivalent of a conductance, which is what we're dealing with here, this is a conductance, it is the sum of the conductance inverse of the conductances. And so the overall conductance, uh, one over the overall conductance here, will then be proportional to one over K gas over here and uh, K liquid, which is uh, over here, okay? Uh, now, remember that a mass transfer, interface mass transfer coefficient is related to two things. It's related to how much mixing there is in here. Um, and it's also related to the diffusion uh, coefficient of, of gas, okay? Uh, and similarly here, there'll be a certain degree of mixing in the liquid side, uh, uh, which is, I'm going to get rid of that one there and get back to that. So, so over here, there'll be a diffusion in the uh, liquid side of things. Oh, and I wanted to change it to here and the mixing that happens inside here as well. Um, now for small bubbles it turns out there isn't that much mixing on either of these two. Um, on the gas side though remember that a gas the diffusion coefficient, so, so these are related to the diffusion coefficient now, so this would be the diffusion coefficient of the gas. Uh, and diffusion in the gas is related to the, like the mean free path in a gas which is way, way bigger uh, than uh, the diffusion coefficient in a liquid. Uh, now, one over a, a big thing, okay, uh, is a small thing, okay? And so if you have one over a big thing and one over a relatively smaller thing, then this goes away, okay? Uh, so that means then that the total here is related to only the liquid side. And so uh, I keep reminding you that we're worried about this, this concept of a KLA, a mass transfer coefficient for, in for, uh, for, for mass transfer. That little L is to remind you it's all about the liquid here. So the gas interface, uh, um, um, gas liquid interface mass transfer is basically determined by how large the, the, the interface mass transfer coefficient is on the liquid side, and we don't have to worry about the gas side, which is convenient. Um, so I'm going to uh, clear all right, and go to the next slide. A few concepts here on uh, refining the, uh, the mass uh, transfer. Uh, 
Um, and uh, the mass transfer is, is related to the, again, the driving force over the resistance or conductance in that. And so we need to define what this driving force is and we need to define uh, the total mass transfer again. Uh, and that total mass transfer is times the total area per unit volume because in order to get mass transfer rate per total volume, we're going to have to, uh, we're going to have to have that incorporated into the A and the units of the check layer. So what we're talking about here then is the conductance scale A and this A is the key here uh, because we can't really, it turns out, we can't manipulate KL too, too much, but we can certainly do uh, manipulate the interfacial area per volume. Because if I take this bubble here and I chop it up into pieces, okay, uh, and make little bubbles, um, clearly now there's going to be a lot more area per, per volume uh, for uh, than that bubble there. Um, now, engineers, we, we pretend to be smart. Um, and so remember that KL, we don't really know it. We just kind of know what some of the things it's dependent on, like how fast I turn my impeller and the diffusion coefficient was the one we had, uh, looked at here. And interfacial area is, you know, how big are my bubbles and things like that. We don't know either of them. And so what's great to do when you don't know two things is make it one thing. <laughs> And so KLA is this um, combined parameter that we don't know except by correlations. Now we've talked a lot about correlations in this class, right? Is, is correlations are when something's complex and uh, we don't have a really a, a theory to, to, to uh, base our, our, our assessment on. And so what we do is we do experiments and we fit things. Okay, so uh, this would be sort of a return, if you will, to um, the uh, concepts that we had earlier in the course where we could take a bunch of data uh, and we could measure the KLA as a function of something like, let's say, impeller RPM. Okay, uh, we'll get a correlation and then we'll fit it with it with a to, to get that information. So um, that's the concept that's here. And it's uh, the KLA is a function of focal size, which is of course mixing, coalescence, and so forth. Um, and because it has coalescence and stuff like that, and we're not really like talking about a window and a building and, uh, and, and the amount of heat being lost here, uh, a correlation is for something like mass transfer uh, are, 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 are more complicated and they're less reliable. Uh, and so it's hard to, to necessarily, and so it's not unusual to characterize these yourself for your reactors. So if you, you work for a pharmaceutical company, you're gonna grow something in there. You'd read your proprietary kind of internals in your reactor, your baffling, your impellers and all, uh, you would, make an assessment of what the KLA would be for that, that system. And if you want to learn about that, more about that, then take my advanced biochemical engineering class and we'll talk about those kinds of things. Um, now, the driving force is, is a little potentially confusing, but not too much. I mean, normally you'd think about this and you'd say, oh, uh, the driving force is clearly the concentration of the gas and then the concentration of the liquid. Not correct. Remember the concentration of gas if this was air would be about uh, the mole fraction would be about 0.21, right? Um, and we already established in some of the calculations of respiration and so forth that this thing was like six parts per million. Um, and so uh, because of Henry's law and because of the fundamental relationships at equilibrium, um, the concentration that we're, we're working with here, I mean, this, this is a, means there's no net trans, mass transfer is zero, right? At equilibrium, the net mass transfer is zero. What same amounts coming in as going out. And so this represents a delta C, right, of zero, okay? Uh, delta C equals zero. Um, so uh, clearly this minus that is not zero, so that doesn't make sense. 
Um, and uh, this, uh, you're supposed to have an, the word non in front of it. Uh, under non-equilibrium, that is where there is, there is mass transfer taking place, would occur when the liquid has a concentration lower than its equilibrium solubility, okay? This is the thing that, that is related to Henry's law. Okay. H, Henry's law here. Uh, and so um, the further, the lower this number is, uh, the bigger the driving force, right? So the faster mass transfer will occur. Uh, and so uh, this it doesn't make sense, okay? That is delta C from here, uh, but this does make sense. Okay, the driving force is basically related to the equilibrium mass transfer minus the actual concentration in the liquid. And under this situation, we still have when delta C equals zero, uh, when mass transfer is equal to zero, i.e. Uh, it's completely inside equilibrium. And in converse is when, uh, when, when, when C of the liquid is, is small, then mass transfer is fast. Uh, and so think about this now as a sort of primer on really understanding uh, interface mass transfer and why we express the equations uh, the way we do. Okay, uh, we'll go to the next slide now and we're gonna talk about sort of like our basic understanding of the concepts of the world of mass transfer. Um, interface mass transfer. Easiest one of all is, you know, this morning I rode my bike in uh, and despite being in April, uh, the wind chill was, they, they think they said around 23 degrees for the wind and I was on a bike adding some additional and so probably it was in you know, less than 20 degrees Fahrenheit now. Um, so uh, we understand wind chill factor, right? We know that when the wind blows, um, you lose heat faster. Um, and, 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 and so uh, as a result of that, uh, it's not terribly surprising. Again, remember the heat transfer has that little advantage of this being known, right? Uh, this may well be my area of my house and, I, and, and or my area of my window. I want to know how much is there. And then uh, the heat transfer coefficient is dependent on how big the wind is, right? Uh, lots of wind, bigger heat transfer coefficient. Uh, in the world of a, a bubble, it's just, or wait, frankly, any mass transfer from an object, it could be a falling crystal in water or something like that, um, the faster that this rises uh, will be the fat, the, its, its, its rise velocity will be directly related to here. Uh, a big problem in the bubble world, if, if this is, uh, if, let's say this is a solid, for example, if this was a solid um, piece of material, um, um, then my A would be known, right? My area would be directly observable based on simple geometry of a object. Uh, now, um, where we're headed next, as you might, imagine is we're going to, if we have this be a, uh, a bubble and the bubble can be uh, broken up into a lot of pieces, it's kind of hard to measure the area. Okay. And so we need to, to correlate it for that. Okay. Um, going on to then the, the next. Okay. So here we go. Um, this is then, what, what is it dependent on? All the time I talk about, uh, you know, what you really ought to be doing is not thinking about what equation you use for things, but do I understand the terms in the equation, right? And so this uh, interface mass transfer coefficient is dependent on, as we said, the relative velocity, if you will, uh, the, diffu the diffusivity of, walk of, of, of walk oxygen in water. Okay, because remember that we're talking about the L here and that L gives rise to this being the important thing is in fact uh, the diffusivity of, of, of oxygen in water, not the diffusivity of oxygen, for example, in air. 
Um, now, I make this point here is that KL is not affected by operating conditions, which may seem counterintuitive, but not really. Uh, because um, I, if, if I increase my impeller RPM, okay, um, what I will end up doing is I will certainly be making the water go around in, in, in circles faster. Uh, but because there's such a big difference in the density of, of gas and a liquid, um, the, that density difference um, will mean that this thing just moves with that. I mean, it's constantly trying to go up, right? Because it's buoyancy. Um, but whether or not it's inside a fluid element that's moving around the tank really, really, really fast, okay, it really doesn't matter to it. It doesn't change the what it feels. It's like you being on the planet Earth, right? And the fact that we're scooting through the universe at a gazillion miles of hour and we're running around in circles doesn't mean that I feel a huge mass transfer coefficient because of these, because these, I don't feel them. Uh, they don't affect the wind that I feel. Okay, so this is your uh, understanding of KL. Uh, let's go to understanding of uh, of, of A, okay? Interfacial area per unit volume. Clearly, mixing will give rise to breakup, if you will, breakup and coalescence. As And surface tension, if you vaguely remember back to the Laplace equation, uh, the Laplace equation uh, was the equation that we had discussed um, in, in, in which the, the pressure on the uh, inside of the bubble uh, was equal to the pressure on the outside uh, as it relates to then uh, the uh, one over uh, the surface tension over 2R. Uh, I think that's it. Uh, break clause. Can work you that. So his surface tension then gives rise to the pressure inside the balls, uh, the, the bubbles, if you will. And we talked a lot about the impact, if you will, of, of of the impact. And that is when two things hit together that are very high pressure and rigid, they tend to bounce off each other. Uh, and so surface tension does play a very large role. We talked a little bit about uh, salt water, for example. If you're looking at a salt water aquarium, you tend to see very small bubbles. Uh, that's because they tend to, it alters the surface tension so that they, uh, they stay tiny. And when the bubbles stay tiny, the high pressure, they bounce off each other and they don't coalesce in contrast to a, a fish tank, a uh, freshwater fish tank where you hear the club, club, club. Um, so now look at the impact of the same volume, if you will. And now I take two of them and take that volume in by half and then again by four in that. And then I look here at what the uh, area is, right? Uh, and what you can see here is, is, is that I've already now doubled the interfacial area per unit volume by splitting up the bubbles that are here. And having twice as much interfacial area per unit volume means twice as much mass transfer. And so this is the game that we're actually um, playing in a bioreactor based system because you could say, hey, let's just make them as small as we can. We'll just crank up the impeller and bust everything into the smallest bubbles we can. But the problem is, is that uh, your cells will become, uh, and particularly, let's, let's go with Chinese hamster ovary cells being mammalian cell lines, uh, they will be uh, unhappy. And as a result of that, you're going to end up with uh, dead cells as a result of their, um, the impeller breaking them up, not just simply breaking up bubbles. So uh, we'll clear everything there and we'll scoot now to the real complexity of a reactor system. And the real complexity of a reactor system is, is not just a bubble or thinking uh, simply as a bubble because there's a surface effect, okay? Uh, there's coalescence, there's breakup, there's depth in the tank, right? The, and, and, and surface effects, for example, are really important to this concept of scale up or scale down, okay? And if I have a small, small reactor, uh, like the ones in my lab, you know, they're about 
actually one to five liters. Okay. Um, it turns out that when I run that reactor, I could easily have 20% of my uh, mass transfer um, come from the interfacial area between the top and the bottom. Um, you can do the math at home, but if I was to take that reactor and make it uh, a lot bigger and, and have the surface area, have the same aspect ratio, meaning the diameter of the tank uh, here to the, to the height of the liquid and height of the liquid here and so forth, same aspect ratio. Um, do the calculation of the interfacial area per unit volume. And what you'll see then is, is that I tend to scale up for, for pilot scale reactors to full blown scale reactors. And I get a reactor that's 40,000 liters, okay? Even if I have an open top on it, it won't actually uh, give a significant contribution to mass transfer. So whereas here in a small scale system, you actually run under uh, small low mass transfer uh, where, where, where I'm sorry, the, the mass transfer due to the bubbles here may only be 80%. Here it's going to be 99.9. Okay. There isn't much contribution to that. Now that means that everybody that's in the laboratory trying to test productivity and figure out how much, uh, for instance, how much money they're going to make, uh, and they do their, pro, their calculations, they're always going to be disappointed when they get to a large scale system. Um, the reason is, is that it doesn't. Now you have the option, and it's called scale down, of where, for example, you might purge nitrogen over the surface to decrease the, uh, the partial pressure of oxygen. Try to scale the interface, get rid of this interface area per volume at the small scale, and therefore you'll have productivity that's more representative of a large scale system. That's referred to as scale down. Okay. Uh, we always talk about scale up. But honestly, the smart thing is you run your small scale systems so that when you're predicting how much money you're going to make in the big one, you actually get it right. Uh, bubble coalescence, you know, we talked certainly about it. I mean, I mentioned one thing, and that is, is that if I have a sparger here and I have a downflow impeller like this, uh, it turns out that I'm going to crowd bubbles. I may decrease my mass transfer by increasing my RPM by virtue of actually facilitating coalescence through excessive downflow of, of the impeller itself. In contrast to the radial impellers that we talked about that are designed specifically to break up bubbles. Um, um, and so that's where the bubble breakup takes place near the, the shear, if you will. And of course, the tip speed here is the highest shear rate. And there's little vortices on this thing too that give rise to the flow coming off the impellers that have a tendency to also uh, break things up. Uh, and then we always said, we talked a lot about uh, formation as well, right? We talked about orifice spargers. <laughs> well, orifice sparger, well, it's a pipe. Um, a ring sparger, you know, where you drill holes in it, so it's a big metal donut. Could be 10 feet in diameter for a big system here. And, uh, and then ultimately centered metal spargers as well, which are basically ceramic stainless steel, if you will. Uh, and they give rise to very, very, very small bubbles. And this is what you'll see in a show or a mammalian cell or EPO type uh, situation. Um, <clears throat> so apparently we still have a couple more things to talk about here that, uh, that are related to this. I always like this as a reminder. Of, of the big picture that we're, we're working with here. And that is, you know, gas holdup effects, mixing effects, circulation, they all are complex. And as a result, since you have to then predict mass transfer, uh, this is all based on correlations. And correlations, again, are based on bidding. I-T-T-I-N-G. And we all know how to do fitting, for example, to equations by doing minimization of some square error, et cetera, and uh, trying to come full circle for the, for the class. Um, so let's look a little more detail at the, this, this graph here. And if you really get this graph, you really will get interface mass transfer. Um, for some reason, it doesn't, there, it wasn't giving me the annotation pane. So, the uh, partial pressure of gas 
is basically the mole fraction, and we'll put, for instance, the mole fraction, let's use oxygen as the example here. Uh, the mole fraction of oxygen times the total pressure would equal the partial pressure. This is important because this would represent the partial, I'm sorry, the, the mole fraction of this times the total pressure uh, of the system is equal to the partial pressure. Okay. Um, you know, not too surprising. Throw back to, I think, Thermo 2. Um, uh, this is the Henry's Law coefficient. Okay, so Henry's Law here, Henry's. Uh, uh, the Hen Henry's Law uh, is for uh, circumstances unlike Raoult's Law, where you have high solubility. Henry's Law is what you do when you have low solubility, and I've mentioned you know, before. Uh, the real issue here is the fact that remember that water likes to hold hands. Uh, for hydrogen bonding. And so uh, since there's, you know, they're already holding hands, there's not room for Henry, uh, or actually not Henry, but oxygen. And so uh, this is an important characteristic we'll talk about before because there's some, you know, uh, some interesting behaviors here. Uh, and that is when you increase the temperature, you decrease the solubility of, of gases like oxygen and water. And that's because the thermal energy uh, it, it literally shakes them out of, of, of solution. And this is what you see uh, before your pot boils in your, like in your spaghetti. As you increase the temperature there, the dissolved gases from your spigot come out of solution. And it's why many people uh, screw up their, their spaghetti because they think it's boiling, but it's not. Mass transfer coefficient. Uh, we've talked about a lot, don't need to talk more about that. Uh, the equilibrium uh, solubility, well, we just defined that here in terms of Henry's law, that's just physics. And this is the dissolved oxygen, um, DO. Unfortunately, it's, it's the opposite of remember what OD was. Optical density was what we typically use uh, to measure the uh, numbers of cells, concentrations. So this is uh, like cell density X or uh, that kind of thing. Uh, so we're not talking about OD here. We're talking about dissolved oxygen. Okay. And this is the equilibrium, Henry's law, and so forth. And there we have our nice mass balance now that we can look at and mass transfer or the change of the concentration uh, in, 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 in here, uh, in, in the liquid phase, that's why there's an L here, concentration of oxygen in the liquid phase with time uh, is related to the mass transfer coefficient, interface mass transfer coefficient, KLA, uh, times the driving force, which is the equilibrium minus the uh, dissolved oxygen level. And the dissolved oxygen level is what I would be buying my probe for, right? I stick this in the reactor, and in that reactor, it tells me my relative oxygen level, it turns out, because uh, usually these are just simply calibrated, and so 100% DO means there's no mass transfer. Um, it, it's completely saturated. Um, and when I say 50%, it means that, yeah, there is mass transferring, uh, and at you know, half the driving force uh, maximum, which would be if DO is close to zero. Um, clear. Okay. Um, you know, just again, a reminder that there are more than one interface here, and this is a concept that um, you don't find a lot of discussion in, in, in the book uh, or the books, shall we say, uh, because we always, almost always, focus on this gas liquid interface. Um, the reason is, is that the cells are so small and so distributed within the water for something like an in E. coli system um, that uh, we can pretty much assume that once it gets through the boundary layer, it gets consumed. So here's your, here's your boundary layer here. And then once that oxygen makes its way into here, there's a whole lot of cells in here. Uh, we should go to brown, right? Okay. There's a whole lot of cells inside here that are going to consume that, uh, and then we don't really worry about this boundary layer here, 
uh, which would be the boundary layer between the solid of the cells and, and, and the water cell. It turns out that for uh, many systems like an immobilized cell particles, uh, large tissue like we happen to work with, which would be like uh, somatic uh, embryos, plants, um, and other things like tissue engineering. If you're trying to grow a tissue like skin cells are grown for burned victims and things like that, uh, there you, you have a pretty large cell system here and not a teeny weeny um, E. coli type thing. And so you can have a circumstance where, although the books spent essentially all their time talking about this air-water interface here, uh, where that actually is no longer limiting, that it can actually be here at the water cell interface. And so I have just a couple comments on that before we wrap up um, the, uh, the talk here. So let's take a look at the one that we just explained. Uh, 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 well, actually, <laughs> this is not the one. Uh, this is more analogous to the immobilized enzyme system that we had talked about. Um, I'm sorry, no, it's, this, this is in fact a medium. Um, so, so here we have, I uh, just uh, need to look at this. Uh, we needed to, oh, let's get purple here. Um, we have air, let's call it air here. Uh, we have water here. Um, and, and we're really now talking about the air-water interface. Um, and in this solution here is where you have everything sort of, if you will, respiring and so forth. And so this is the, the, the biological oxygen event, okay? So in a reactor, it, the more cells I have in, in, in the system, um, the more they're going to breathe. And so this is a per unit biological oxygen per mass, and this is mass per volume. And so this is the total respiration in the system. Uh, well, that, if you will, is demand, right? This is the demand. Um, and we all got our A's and econs, so uh, we like the supply demand analogy. Uh, this is demand, and this is supply. Uh, the supply is how much comes from the, the, uh, the gas, right? Uh, well, this is what we just got done talking about. We talked about the uh, interfacial area for volume and KO and so forth. Um, and um, here's the driving force, and this is a dissolved oxygen and so forth as well. Um, this is the classic interface mass transfer type calculations where Basically, you can only make this so large. The largest you could possibly make this is if you basically set it to zero, right? If you let them consume all the oxygen here in, in the liquid, then that would be the maximum driving force, okay? That maximum driving force then can only, you can, will, will allow you to know, uh, since KLA is the operating conditions, right? This is your RPM and all that jazz. The biological oxygen demand is like how many, how much does per a E. coli breathe per cell? That's a constant. And so I can calculate then the density of cells at which I could grow my reactor under various transport conditions. Okay, so that's uh, an important kind of relationship here about sort of the pro how you use this to do calculations of, of productivity. Um, now, let's look at the tissue side. Now, this tissue side here, green, okay? And this would be the bulk li uh, um, liquid now, right? So uh, what we have here, this is media, but this is a solid, right? And so now we're clearly talking about a solid liquid boundary layer mass transfer coefficient, where in contrast to a circumstance where we're talking about breaking up bubbles and so forth, um, here we're talking about the liquid flowing past a solid. And so if this is a, 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 an immobilized cell, for example, or you have a bead, and inside that bead, uh, this is a classic thing that was done for many years for, for antibody production. Um, and there's a lot of them inside this bead. Well, this bead's gonna try to sediment, right? And so the, the faster the, the, the difference between this object and, and its surrounding liquid, that's what determines the 
solid liquid mass transfer coefficient. Okay, so um, other things here, like the dissolved oxygen, well, that in, in the bulk, this is where your probe is. Well, your probe isn't really measuring what's important at this point. It's measuring what's way out here. What's important is what's that, what the cells see. Okay, and so this would be the surface dissolved oxygen level. Uh, at the, and, and then the, in this case, we don't have to talk about interfacial area per unit volume because we now know what it is. It's, it's actually a physically measurable quantity. It's the, the, this is a solid, you just measure its interfacial area. Uh, v is the volume of the tissue, okay? Uh, also, something that's measurable. And the oxygen demand, again, is something that is a characteristic of the cells. Faster growing, faster respiring cells have a higher uh, respiration rate, for example. And so now when I write my equation here, I have my biological oxygen demand per unit cell, and, 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 or in this case, per volume. I multiply that times the volume of the tissue. Uh, I now have a liquid solid mass transfer coefficient. I then have an interfacial area, which is a geometry thing. And I have a driving force, which is this difference between the liquid phase now and a surface. This is just like the touching of the stove problem now uh, in, in the liquid world. And, and, and so you have to be a little bit careful if I'm working with a large object uh, or a large tissue or cell, uh, is that these become mass transfer limited based on their flow velocity of the liquid past it. Again, back to the analogy of a, a Reynolds number dependence uh, on the system. Okay, I think we're about done. Um, and uh, a few comments on scale up because we, it, this is a, a chemical engineering class. And we always tell people the difference between us and the chemist is, is, is that we scale things up. Little reactor to big reactor. I did mention already this issue of the interfacial area in here. Uh, tends to go away with the big ones, but there's a, a more important thing that we're going to be dealing with here, and that is focusing on um, a stirred tank scale up perspective. Uh, it's not atypical to keep a geometry ratio where this is uh, roughly uh, one third the diameter of the tank, but it can be bigger than that, uh, and that would be a sort of geometric similarity but a lot of other things change because it's not possible when you've got a cylinder uh, to do scaling based on, on, on the volume and area, for example. Um, so let me clear that and jump to the next slide. So this here looks at you know, various uh, options of, of scale. The one that uh, might, you might be might you think of as being uh, most familiar with <coughs> is the concept of dynamic and, and, and geometric similarity that you had for like flow in, in pipes and so forth allowed us to take and say, oh, let's, let's just scale it based on Reynolds number. Okay? You set the Reynolds number of the small one equal to the Reynolds number of the, of the, of the big one. Right? That's classic scale up. Uh, if you do that, what you find out is that you have a um, a Reynolds number based uh, scale up here is a, a prohibitive reduction in power. Um, the power tends to go way down, um, and at least the power per volume, and that's the key. Well, this is a predecessor to sort of thinking um, about what scaling is done. And one of them, a typical fermentation criteria, is this, and, and, and that is. Uh, there's a tendency to uh, keep a constant power per unit volume. And it makes sense if you think about it. It's the amount of energy being dissipated in this, this given volume. Okay. Um, this results in a moderate increase in N. Uh, the, the tips, I'm sorry, the uh, um, rotational speed. Um, which can be a problem from a torque mechanics and, and, and things like that. So it, it may be hard uh, to do that. Uh, and we've already mentioned that one of the ways to avoid this is rather than do scaling uh, based on, on geometric similarity now, 
uh, there would be a tendency to go to taller, skinnier tanks so you can have additive power uh, rather than power going up uh, with the diameter to the, to the fifth power. Um, and so the, uh, you know, the, so, so, uh, so, so this, is, uh, this is E. coli well. If you can get away with it, it means your, your, your machine, your, your impeller is capable of being cranked up uh, and you're not gonna kill your cells because if they're so small, uh, constant power per unit volume is a great uh, uh, tip, uh, criteria. Uh, now tip speed, uh, which tip speed, by the way, if you think about it, is pi is, is a, uh, around one revolution, pi uh, d. Uh, um, it's proportional to this. Um, uh, pi d uh, times RPM, that'll give you a, an actual uh, uh, tip speed. Um, remember that out there on the tip, you know, in here next to the, uh, the impeller shaft, as you will, uh, it's going pretty slow, right? It's going, eh. Okay, this one has to go eh, the whole way around, and so the tip out here in the tip is where there's a, a lot of shear. Um, for something like the, the land of, of um, EPO, for example, uh, this is a typical scale-up criteria. Uh, so for Chinese hamster ovary cells that are, are quite uh, sensitive to being broken up, we can't afford to just keep increasing the power, because if we do, we'll kill them. Um, and so, as a reasonable uh, kind of rule of thumb for, for scale up here, is that you, know, you go at the same tip speed, uh, keeping in mind that when I'm swinging something, uh, you've ever been on a merry-go-round, right? Okay, you learn pretty quickly that there's a big, big difference between being here and being out here, right? Okay, um, and I got a chip tooth uh, from, from, from this, uh, from we used to play spin people till they, till they would puke, um, and uh, hold on for dear life kind of thing on, on spinning on the merry-go-round, because once you start to get out in here, I mean, the speed of this thing going around is, is quite high. Um, and, and if you're gonna have that speed, the linear speed be constant, then it's going to mean that the rotational speed goes down a lot. Okay, so the rota in order to accomplish this, you do that. And that means you have a reduction for power per unit volume, which means you can't maintain your interfacial area for volume, which means that you lose productivity as you go to large scales. So ch chode cultures are characterized by, as we tend to try to keep them reasonably happy, okay, uh, we do that by reduction per power for volume, which means that we get less money per volume, but you still get more money because there's more value. Okay. Uh, the main goal though here, and one of the characteristics I like to make sure that we, we uh, I emphasize is there is not a best way to scale up. I mean, that may be disconcerting to you. And it's like, because it was so easy for the pipe world. Uh, but every company does it slightly different, and this is part of the trade secrets and, and so forth of how we run and design our reactors. Um, simple comment here that, that we cover way more in, in advanced uh, bioprocess engineering is to then think about how this actually plays out when we're, we're talking about a reactor. Um, when I have a reactor system here, and this reactor has an aspect ratio that would be kind of short and squat, that's kind of typical of what you would, uh, would tend to see uh, for a Cho reactor, for example. So we'll grab uh, pink. Um, so let's say it's Cho in here. Uh, well, you have various ways in which you can implement process control, and I don't have time to go into a lot of that here, but just think very simply. Um, I have a choice if my dissolved oxygen starts to go down, okay, one of my options would be to increase the RPM, right? Because I increase RPM, I'll increase interfacial area per unit volume, and I'll give rise to more mass transfer to get my thing back up. I could alternatively, uh, I could just turn on my 
uh, an oxygen supply. You know, so, so bleed in some extra oxygen into the system, that would do it. And you might say, hey, you know what I also could do, which would be cheap, is I would just increase the gas flow rate. But remember, this is a risk. Because if I increase gas flow rate, I can also increase the size of my bubbles, and I can also increase coalescence. Okay, and so the little moral of the story I wanted to end with here is uh, some things can happen that um, uh, are counterintuitive. You, let's say you're looking at the dissolved oxygen and trace, and here's DO as a, as a function of, uh, of time. And as your cells are growing, you know, it's going there, your controllers are trying to do things, and then all of a sudden it starts to go down, and you're like, oh, I see that it's heading the wrong way. And then right at this time, you go like, oh, I'm gonna increase the gas flow rate, VVM. If you increase VVM, and your net result of that is to decrease, increase VVM, uh, it's going to go down. Uh, would be to decrease uh, A, if you will, in KLA, uh, it crashes, okay? And so here you were headed downhill and it, uh, it will, it'll crash out on you. Uh, other aspects of control are pretty intuitive and so forth, but I really wanted to just sort of remind you that the whole goal of this ultimately is to implement mass transfer, okay, in a bioreactor. And that implementation then gives rise to the growing of our, Okay, and there's our product in this particular case, EPO, uh, or in the wonderful world of the $400 billion industry of the monoclonal antibodies that are, uh, weren't even on the radar when I was a student here. Um, okay, uh, that I believe is it. Okay, just a final reminder that uh, this was a uh, uh, sort of a synopsis, if you will, for these two case studies. Uh, remember the insulin being a microbial system. Uh, here, the real problem often is, is they grow so fast that they actually generate heat of respiration. And one of the real problems is actually getting heat out of the system um, because we've gotten so good at putting a lot of oxygen in based on the impeller designs and, and so forth here. Now we typically just do this with the air. Um, because the EPO or the CHO cell system is um, so sensitive to being ch chopped up by the impellers, we have a tendency to run these big impellers slowly. And because of that, we can't really break up the bubbles. If we can't break up the bubbles, then we have trouble with scale up. And so as a result, the EPO world tends to be constrained to sort of less than 20,000 liters. Um, um, and, 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 so, and considerably left in many cases. Uh, whereas the E. coli world, you know, you can pretty much uh, you know, run this up until the point where you will literally deflect a, the shaft. Uh, and as I mentioned, you know, 50,000 liters uh, plus. Uh, the real issue is, is if you were to actually look at this, when it's running, there's so much torque on this that they'll be deflected. Uh, they'll, they'll, they will actually be twisting the, the shafts such that uh, they're, they're offset on, on each of those. And that concludes uh, sort, of the, uh, sort of the connection, if you will, of mass transfer uh, to uh, oxygen interface, gas mass transfer uh, to the uh, bioreactor design. Um, and that's the end.